context, a lot of you probably know Honor bought Home Instead three years ago now. And we've been doing a bunch of work to not only integrate what Honor had built before we bought Home Instead, but also build other pieces of technology to help home care owners fundamentally grow their businesses. And this is the result in 2023. We grew our top line home care by $171 million in that year, which is like a lot of growth, right? And you would think that, therefore, I'm like super happy and drinking margaritas or something like that on a beach, except the truth is, that's kind of how I feel. So why do I feel that way, right, if, if we're going so fast? And my message to you all today is that I'm going to talk about the why, and I'm going to argue to you that you should feel the same way I do. And I'm going to talk to you about what I think we all can collectively do about it. So I think a lot of you have probably seen this video. Can you raise your hand if you've seen this video? Let's see how many have. Okay, less than I expected. I'm gonna play this video. I'm gonna tell you ahead of time that this is not the video that you should be scared of, okay? Not the video to be scared of. All right, let's watch a video. Currently, Optimus has the ability to fold clothes quickly. While you might think this is not too necessary compared to folding clothes by hand in a few seconds, if you're faced with a task of folding hundreds of pieces of clothing... Okay, we can pause the video. Well, you guys are going to control it. Okay. So, Tesla's bot has the dexterity to fold clothes. Now, that's pretty impressive, right? And if you operate any kind of a business where you are being paid to send a human into a home to do stuff for people like manipulate an egg, which it can also do, cook an egg, which it can also do, fold clothes, which it can also do, you are not going to be paid for that in five years. You're just not, right? Because if someone can buy a robot that can fold their clothes for free every time the robot folds the clothes, they are not going to pay a human to fold their clothes. It's just economics. But that's not the video to be scared of. The one to be scared of is the next video. You guys want to just roll the next video? Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate, and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Great, can I have something to eat? Sure thing. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. Great. So, based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great. Can you put them there? Of course. All right, so how do you think you did? I, I think I did pretty well. The apple found its new owner, the trash is gone, and the tableware is right where it belongs. I agree. Thanks, figure one. So, so what's happening in AI is that it is now able to predict the future really well 
because of all of the patterns of the past. And it was able to do, like we got this technology that everybody's excited about in AI in about 2015. But it wasn't the thing that most people could understand because it wasn't chat GPT. It wasn't talking to it. It was predictive analytic models based on data. And so it was really server side stuff that could do something like this. This is us in 2019 where we would use the same technology you just saw on the server side. And in this case, this is a model that figures out the likelihood of whether or not a care pro, so the people who, we, you know, caregivers, paid caregivers, is going to churn, like quit, in X period of time. We were predicting the future using the exact same technology that drove that robot. It's just that it was server side stuff that would spit out an answer in a model and then we could know, you know, this person's likely to turn. And the big advancement recently in AI is that now we've applied it to vocabulary. Now we've, prov we've applied it to communication. And the thing that basically had to happen to apply it to communication was more bandwidth and more data storage and faster retrieval of that data so that the computer could look over a very large corpus of information in the past and predict the words it should say to you when you ask it a question. That's kind of the big innovation that happened when we went into conversational or generative AI. The thing about the businesses that we all run, and the reason why so many people in 2019 when I showed this model would always say to me, maybe what you're thinking right now is, Seth, you just don't get it. This is a human business. Robots are never going to take care of humans. Technology is never going to figure out who the good care pro is for Mrs. Smith. But the thing is, is that with AI, technology is not this is a good care pro. Technology has become this is a good care pro for Mrs. Smith. Technology can now handle the heterogeneity of humanity. And here's the real thing about technology versus humans today. Technology is better at handling the heterogeneity of humans than humans are themselves. And what do I mean by that? So when we do an ML regression, like a machine learning regression, of what we call defects, which are things that our clients don't like in the service we deliver. One of the things we see is that they do not like talking to a lot of different people when they call our 800 number. Now the reason they don't like it is the same reason that you guys hate calling customer service at United. Right? It's like you get another person who doesn't know the context, who says, hold on a second while I look at your record, and they try to figure out all the stuff to help you with your customer service complaint, and you're like, I have to re-explain everything. Same reason our clients didn't like that experience with us. But the funny thing is, is that with AI today, very, very, very soon, you're not going to talk to human customer service agents when you call United. Because when you call, you will have a complete voice conversation where you can stutter, and you can say the wrong word, and you can say, hold on a minute, let me think about it. And the machine will just talk to you like a human but it will know everything about your entire history. Just automatically loaded in its brain. It's, you're not gonna have to deal with the person who has to review your record, hold on a second, I don't know the context. Right, that machine is gonna know everything about you. And it will be able to perfectly help you with your customer service experience when you talk to it in whatever language you wanna talk to it in. And that's why AI now can be so much more effective for our very human businesses because it can know everything about you individually and everything about your million customers individually, right? And give you the best, most personalized experience, most human experience possible, better than a human can because a human just can't hold it all in their heads. So if we go to the next slide, so this is 2019. What our machine learning or AI ML, machine learning AI, same thing. What our ML models are doing today is they are now looking at the totality of our service delivery 
they are looking at factors that they have determined that make clients happy and not happy. And they are literally predicting the future on, hey, if I could get like this kind of, more of this kind of human to be a caregiver, I would make my total customer base happier. So it's basically scanning all of our service delivery and it's saying, hmm, I could use more of, you know, a caregiver with this kind of tra training in that zip code. And what that model then automatically feeds into our recruiting systems is, oh, I need to now prioritize these kinds of applicants who are applying right now. Because if I prioritize them, not first in, first out on people applying, but rather prioritized funneling, then I could make our existing customer base happier, faster, and I could constantly top grade the experience of receiving home care. And that's where, that's the kind of stuff we're working right now. In fact, I just asked the team, literally right now, for any given service delivery action that we take, there are 22 AI models, like artificial intelligence models, in the background, figuring stuff like this out in order to help us provide ultimately a better human caregiving experience, right? Basically to get a more reliable, better caregiver for your individual needs to your home. Create a better job for that caregiver where they're happier, right? And a better care experience for that client by matching so much better using this AI stuff. So um, I've got two minutes left and then a little bit of uh, juggling around. The point I want to make to you all is the following. And again, they said be controversial, right? So I'm being controversial. I would argue that if, if you're looking at your business today and you're saying to yourself, well, geez, I, I'm running this care business and this care business is a very human business. I kind of have to dabble in this AI stuff and I have to dabble in this technology stuff and maybe buy some stuff from like this vendor here or that vendor there and try to figure out how to cobble them together. I'd argue that that's like a risky path, a very risky path. Because with where technology is now, with where AI is now, literally the core of how you run your business should actually be run by technology. The periphery should be very human, right? The technology should be making the humans better, giving the care pros better jobs, giving the clients better care. But the core has got to be technology. And so then the question for you, right, as you think about your business, is if that is true, right, if technology is now, if it's now become so clear that technology has come for this industry, and it doesn't matter if you're private pay, Medicare, Medicaid, it doesn't matter, right? If technology has come for this, what parts of that technology stack are you going to own, right? What parts of that technology stack are you going to uniquely develop or uniquely deploy so that you are better than your competitors? And what parts of that technology stack are you going to outsource to other vendors in the room who have really interesting technologies, right, and really interesting opportunities for us all? And that's the question that, you know, we ask, honestly, ourselves every day, right? What should we build ourselves? What parts of the tech stack do we need to own to make sure that we remain competitive and keep providing the absolute best level of care? And what parts can you know, we farm out with to and work with vendors? Like a lot of folks in the room. But you know, rem remember, it is literally all about creating a better human experience at the end of the day, right? But just know that if you think about those videos that I showed, Right? Technology has absolutely hit the point now where I think everybody in this room can see. Right? You can see it with your own eyes. Those robots, they're only, that's like I'm showing you 18 month old technology. In 18 months, the combination of hardware and AI produced those robots. I'm nervous because I know definitively if that's where we are in 18 months, Imagine where the world's going to be in two years, right? And so that means that large swaths of our business are going to fundamentally change. 
given where technology is headed. And so then I revert back to this, okay, so therefore, what do we fundamentally need to be? What technology do we need to fundamentally own in order to ensure that we provide great care to lots and lots of older adults and amazing jobs for care pros as we continue to advance the company? So with that, I hope that was sufficiently controversial. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Seth.